John McKay, and with Extracting the Best from Every Day with Dr. John McKay, and having a podcast and talking with innovators and other people in the industry as far as natural products and all modes of extraction and analytical testing. And with me today is uh, Mr. Eric Kalka from Cadia Science up in the nowhere in Vermont and being able to speak about some of the things that he's doing and some of his impressions of extraction. So welcome, Eric. Good morning, Dr. McKay. Thank you for having me. Ah, it looks like you have a whole bunch of equipment in the background there. That seems encouraging. <laughs> you still have a business and, and the roof hasn't caved in in Vermont. The wheels are still rolling. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit of, about yourself and, and Caddis as a, uh, as a research organization up in Vermont. Yeah, so we're a, an R&D company where we uh, focus our efforts on optimizing and really broadening our understanding of utilizing what we refer to as SFX technology and how that relates to extraction and purification of natural products. And so when I refer to SFX technology, I'm referring to supercritical fluid extraction, SFE, supercritical fluid uh, chromatography, SFC, both on the analytical and preparative scale, um, as well as other techniques such as countercurrent chromatography, uh, um, utilizing CO2 as an anti-solvent for particle uh, engineering and also rapid expansion of CO2 once again for, for particle uh, formation. Um, That's pretty interesting. That's a lot of a, lot of a, a mouthful. But yes. um, maybe a couple of things because I think most people are, are familiar, believe they're familiar with the extraction side, but that's just one piece of it and just using CO2 by itself and are there other modes for even from the extraction side before you branch out into some of the other things? Yeah, you know, uh, CO2 is a very flexible solvent, right? As many people know, um, you know, by, by simple modifications of, of a pressure or temperature, right? One could uh, change the density of CO2, which affects the solvency of, 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 that, of that solvent, right? And so why, do, why is it good for natural products? Well, for example, cannabis, um, you know, the plant makes 500 plus different compounds. Um, and and uh, these compounds, of course, can be gr grouped into different classes, such as flavonoids, terpenoids, cannabinoids. And as you focus in on, on uh, as a whole, or focus in on, on these classes, we know that THCA is totally different than, than THC. Alpha pinene is totally different than beta carophyllene. And alpha pine is definitely different than CBD, right? And so how could one pick one solvent to extract and maintain the integrity of these classes of, of compounds? That's really difficult, right? And so with CO2, now we're given the ability to, um, to manipulate the properties of CO2 to uh, get preference on different classes of compounds. Uh, so on, on the extraction side, it, it makes a, you know, a great solvent for that. Of course, you could add different modifiers to CO2 to further manipulate the properties. Um, and then on the chromatography side, it's equally as, as beneficial where now all of a sudden we have a, you know, a nonpolar solvent that we don't have to evaporate on the, on the back end. Um, so it, it's definitely a, you know, a, a nice technology for, for natural products. So when you say nonpolar solvents, what other kind of solvents besides CO2 are, are nonpolar? Uh, Hexane, right? Any kind of large hydrocarbon, uh, hexane, you know, pentane. Um, so as you kind of move up the, the, the carbon chain, that solvent typically becomes more, more nonpolar, right? Now with, with CO2, right, neat CO2 is nonpolar and it kind of behaves like, like hexane, but one can manipulate temperature and pressure, right? Or, or add a little modifier, say ethanol, to, to adjust that polarity to make it more, more polar, right? To access a different suite of, of compounds. This is a lot of work that's done in unnatural products with CO2 plus methanol or ethanol, ethyl acetate, and different percentages of those versus the amount of CO2. So I'm supposing within, within your research, you're talking with customers that are wanting something to know all the compounds that are in there and then and then other customers or those customers transitioning to how do I make this into something that I can use so you're probably not going to use methanol most of the time you're going to use ethanol for something that's a little more um, safer I'll say Correct. safer on the side 
Yeah, it depends on what, what class of compounds you're going after. For example, if, if um, you know, we're really, really interested in, in uh, terpenoids derived from cannabis, right? Well, we want to use any co-solvent there because we have to remove that co-solvent, right? And, and sometimes if you have ethanol with certain volatile terpenes, you'll remove the ethanol, but you'll also remove those volatile terpenes, right? So that, that really doesn't make sense. So it really depends on what you're going after, the solubility of those compounds, um, and then you, 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 know, you act accordingly on, on the front end of uh, dialing in the proper parameters of CO2 and modifier if needed. So I'm, I'm visiting the uh, Emerald Conference this week, and I remember it was uh, 2019 that you gave a presentation with the different uh, monoterpenes versus the sesquiterpenes out here. So that, that was interesting in the fact that most people feel like you can't do that with CO2, but you kind of did that in front of a large audience saying, well, if I can't, then why did I? Yeah, you know, one of the biggest myths out there is, uh, you know, CO2 cannot, uh, you, you can't extract terpenes of CO2. And that, you know, as we know now, that, that's completely false. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of terp terpenoids, they're, they're really easy to extract. They're hard to capture. That's a problem. Can we capture <laughs> the terpenes, right? Yeah. Um, and yes, through that work, we've demonstrated, indeed, we, we not only can extract them, we can get preference, right? Within the family of terpenoids, we get preference of monoterpenes over sesquiterpenes, et cetera. And, and we developed a, a really nice uh, methodology for capturing those volatile, um, uh, volatile species. Um, so yeah. That's I, a published I, you know, work. And that's, that's uh, yep, and um, you, you can search uh, for that online, and we'll provide a link um, on, the, on the podcast here that folks could go and, and uh, read more about that. When I'm looking at extraction and all the other tools you have, so I do pontificate on good is not a number. And I can see from the background there that you have a significant number of, I'll call them toys, but I know they're tools. I know they're instruments. So... What do you have in the background there as far as, it look, I can see there's a liquid chromatograph for sure. I can see there's a ultra performance, supercritical. I see there's gas. What else have you got back there? Yeah, so we have a uh, UPLC <laughs> um, uh, with, a mass, with a mass spec on that guy, a PDA okay. and mass spectrometry. Uh, we have a, a UPC squared, so that's uh, SFC based, CO2 based. Okay. Uh, equipped with a PDA, uh, also a, um, a, uh, let's see, I got an uh, evaporative light scattering detector. I was blanking on that. Um, we have a GCMS, um, so for measuring volatiles, also equipped with a, a mass spec on that. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of, a lot of tools. Um, the more, more tools you could put in your analytical toolbox, um, you know, the, the, the faster you could solve a, a problem when it comes to, to natural products and, and the constituents of a natural product. Is there also a flash back behind there? And we, and we, and we also have, <laughs> yep, flash, flash chromatography, um, and then also um, a semi-prep SFC system that could be, and also a, a preparative SFC system. And so when we built the lab, we, we built our lab uh, where, you know, we focus on natural products. Cannabis, of course, is one example of, of a natural products. Um, but for example, right now we have, you know, we have a project looking at cannabinoids from cannabis and entheogens from mushrooms, right? And of course, if you're, if you're analyzing THC from cannabis or psilocybin from, from mushrooms, well, you know, the technology used for, for THC doesn't translate directly to psilocybin from mushrooms, right? Or the methods that we develop to analyze THC definitely doesn't translate to psilocybin. So once again, the more, the more tools we have in our toolbox, the, the easier that job becomes. Um, and so that's why we kind of, you know, as, as we uh, are building our laboratory, we're, we're looking at, you know, different means of, of separation, different means of uh, getting visibility on that, uh, that separation through, through detection. Uh, so that's why we, you know, we, we uh, invest in, in uh, a wide array of, of, of instrumentation. So when I'm looking at a research project, you're, you're not starting off with 10 pounds of material. So you start off with something that's, you know, a small five milliliter and then do some of the original work on that. And then moving to a hundred milliliter, then moving to a 250 and then moving to a five liter and then the same thing 
capturing each one of those components so that you can you can capture a, an extraction in line like at five minutes 10 minutes 11 minutes whatever along the process and then analyze them through the analytical tools to know when different compounds are coming off or what the concentration of those are at time t so you can do kinetics and isolation absolutely right it's understanding the the matrix right and technology how the technology will affect the matrix on a small scale right learning a lot from that and then scaling that right uh to to more of an industri industrial process um and now all of a sudden that gives you the ability to really understand all the variables that that go into that extraction right and a lot of times if we're talking about extraction at least it, it's how do we pull out the stuff that we want but leave behind the stuff that we don't want so we don't have to you know post process that right and so the the you know the more understanding the, the more work that goes on um, on the bench level the bench top instrumentation right the 5 ml vessel and as we scale that of course there's always problems in scaling right um, and each time you solve a problem in scaling, you gain even more information about, about that process. So by the time you go to an industrial scale you know, facility and scale up that method, you know exactly what you anticipate. So when you're looking at that, I would also say um, that it's also the column that you're using and the detector that you're using that's appropriate. So if you're looking for things that don't have a UV chromophore, then you would be using evaporative light scattering as a detection so, yep yep so on, on the chromatography side right um, you know half the battle is identifying the proper station what we would call the stationary things right yeah um and, and you know it's all fit for purpose really what, what's the end goal is is the goal to scale it to you know isolating a constituent at tens to, to hundreds kilograms per day or is it strictly yeah. analytical right and that that those are two different animals and their decision making is different um, but like I said, yeah, your, your first goal is to identify the, the proper media that gives you the, the resolution, what we would call the resolution between constituents. And then, uh, and then the back end, right, of that is detection. It, it, you know, we have to see that we're actually separating out these compounds. And like you said, some compounds uh, have a chromophore. You could use PDA, detect, photodiode array detection, right? However, if we're looking at a, um, you know, a terpenoid, uh, alpha pinene, um, it really doesn't have much UV absorbance, right? So perhaps PDA is not the best tool that we have to, to, to get visibility on compound. We'll go to, you know, evaporative light scattering or, or FID, flame ionization detection, right? Um, so it's all fit for purpose depending on, on what, what constituent you're, you're purifying, what constituent you're, you're extracting. So with all these different toys and all these different things at your availability, and you're sitting in a uh, in a, in, a, in Vermont because I know that it's not snowing there. Besides about 15 inches or so. So, of your typical customers, what kind of problems are you able to solve? Yeah, so a lot of our clients, uh, you know, we're in, in the cannabis space, looking at you know uh, identifying, say, uh, you know, minor constituents of of uh, a matrix. Uh, with the farm bill, you know, with the multiple derivatives of, of cannabinoids now being uh, sold into the marketplace, looking at, you know, especially where, where folks are taking, say, you know, CBD isolate and, and manipulating that through, you know, a heat degradation or acid catalyte, whatever, you know, whatever the, the method is to hmm. create a different cannabinoid. Of course, there's minor constituents that, that, that are being made, minor products, right? And so looking at the minor products, isolating minor products to get full, you know, characterization on that to make sure that, um, you know, the end product is actually safe to sell, right? So a lot of work like that. Um, uh, now a new kind of, you know, space that we're, we're really looking into and, and uh, are doing some work in is within that. entheogens from, like, as I mentioned earlier, from, from mushrooms. Um, so, yeah, it, it's all about, uh, you know, identifying what, what's in that matrix and uh, you know, helping these groups uh, characterize impurities, or helping groups find you know activity, bioactivity within within certain fractions of of um, you know of, of the matrix. Um, so we help on the extraction and the purification side of of those projects. So when I'm looking at some of the more recent work before we were on camera, and that is uh, chiral. What is chiral, and who cares? I mean, tell me a little bit more about that 
Yeah. So uh, chiral, basically, you know, uh, you know, the classic example you hear are uh, your hands, right? A hand, your right hand, it looks like your left hand, right? But you put them together, they're, they're mirror images, right? So they're, they're, they're different. They're both hands, right? But, but, yeah. but they're different, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, in, in chemistry, compounds can have the same molecular, you know, weight, the same uh, makeup, right? However, in 3D space, that, that compound's different. It, you know, say a hydrogen, right? Uh, here's a plane, either it's coming at me or it's coming towards you, John, right? And all of a sudden, these two compounds are, are different, right? And so when it comes to, you know, just extracting the natural product, is it of concern? Yeah, yes, but, but not, you know, not, we're not on high alert, right? But now yeah. once again, once, once we get to manipulation of, of compound A into compound B, right? Well, we're, we're moving away from, you know, a natural product. Now we're becoming, you know, synthetic, semi-synthetic analog of your starting material, right? And now that's when the fun chemistry happens. The, the conversion, right? If there's a chiral center, right? Well, it, it could, it, you, you really don't know what the major product will be. Usually, typically, it's the more stable product, right? But then again, you get a receiving, you can get a receiving mixture, a mixture of, of, of different products. And, you know, um, in, historically, typically in the pharmaceutical world, one isomer can be great and it cure whatever element that, that it's set out to, to cure, while the other isomer may actually cause harm, right? Um, and so with, without having the proper, you know, toxicity studies and pharmacology on these uh, minor byproducts from, from a uh, chemical transformation, right, of, of CBD to, to a different minor cannabinoids, well, that becomes very important looking at the different uh, enantiomers and, and um, getting visibility on that. So looking at all those things, and I have um, another question along the way, because there's obviously a lot of toys in the lab and it's taken a while to accumulate the toys, but how did you, how did you get to this route? So I'm going to say, let's say you're a high school student in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, which I think is redundant except for Philadelphia. And then how did you get here? Because that's, that's 20 years, right? So what happened in the last 20 years that got you to this place? Oh, John, it hasn't been 20 years. We're like, come on, I'm not that old. It's like 10, 12 years, right? 13, maybe. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I graduated uh, my master's <laughs> program in synthetic organic chemistry in 2013. Um, and of course, my last year of, of school, um, you know, I had to make decisions of what, what I wanted to do after, after grad school. And I, I really, you know, contemplated pursuing a PhD program in, in, um, in synthetic organic chemistry. I, I really liked uh, that type, type of work and I was pretty good at it. Um, but really thinking about that step and, you know, the time investment of pursuing such program and, and the dividends on the back end, I really didn't see that as a good fit for me. And that decision was, you know, strictly based on me and, and where I was at, at that time. Um, so I, I didn't pursue a PhD. I contemplated on uh, pursuing an MBA, but ultimately um, ended up opening up a restaurant in, in my hometown, <laughs> hometown of Honestell, Pennsylvania. And uh, not to spend too much time on this, Honestell is uh, you know, a small town in northeastern PA, two and a half hours from New York City, three hours from Philadelphia. The, uh, the population during the summer, summer probably doubles with tourism. One thing the town didn't have was, uh, you know, a nice place for folks to, to enjoy a nice meal and, and, and beverage. And so overall, the project was, was really successful. Uh, but during, during that time, I always kept very a close eye on cannabis and what cannabis was doing in states like, um, you know, Colorado and, and California. And um, in 2015, I attended the Emerald Conference, uh, huh. met a lot of great folks, uh, you know, through the conference and um, went back to Pennsylvania and kind of strategically end of, uh, end of 2015, we got an offer from a group to purchase a restaurant project. And uh, it, it was a favorable deal for us. And so we executed that deal early 2016. And a month after closing, I jump, jumped into a car and, and headed to California. And so, so I knew I wanted to work with cannabis. I knew I wanted to be innovative within the field of cannabis. Yeah. And um, you know, if you want to be innovative, you have to surround your, yourself around innovative people within the field. And 
you know, back then, and even I would argue today, California is probably the, the innovative, you know, hub of cannabis. And so, um, you know, by leveraging my, my contacts that I made at the, the Emerald Conference and fostering those relationships throughout 15, I jumped right into it in, in, in California, um, hooked up with an early, uh, early, you know, startup. And uh, we rented a, a warehouse, warehouse space in Irvine, California, and, uh, and went to work. So that's how I, I started working with, with cannabis. And then uh, eventually migrated back to the East Coast, hooked up with a group in, in Vermont where they were um, launching a preclinical pre -clinical study on various cannabinoid treatments for, for pain mitigation. And so we were hired, or I was hired to, to uh, develop their, their chemistry program. Um, and, and so brought my knowledge that I developed, you know, with CO2 based technologies in California, brought that to Vermont, started working a lot with uh, semi uh, preparative supercritical fluid chromatography. And then, um, so that brings us to like 2018, 2019 with the farm bill now being passed. And we just saw a lot of opportunity that, that, you know, that bill presented and really the pitfalls, you know, by being involved with cannabis, looking at the pitfalls of the THC market, um, you know, we had some good ideas of how we could help the CBD market. And that's what kind of drives me to, to launch Caddis. Um, and we were in Vermont already. Vermont's a, a pretty cool state. Um, and uh, so we, we started, we, you know, we decided to stay in Vermont and, and launch Caddis Scientific. I think that's what you do is you just take the alphabet, you scramble it up. And whatever doesn't fit yeah, on the, the uh, yeah. throw it out. <laughs> whatever doesn't fit on the Scrabble board, you just say whatever we're getting for the for the uh, letters, we'll use the uh, first six, and we'll keep the seventh off to the side. I think that that's you got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, how I good. typically name most of my companies. Um, <laughs> so anyhow, thanks for your time. Uh, appreciate it, and uh, good luck with everything. What's your uh, so on, on the on the parting side? What What's your next uh, exciting project that you see coming up? The future. Yeah, so, so we have, uh, so Vermont just adopted recreational, uh, so on the personal side at least, Vermont adopted um, uh, a, or drafted regulations for adult use. So that's very exciting for us to, to hopefully we can participate in, in that market. And we have some unique um, uh, formulations that we've been working on oh. that are all driven by, by CO2 that we plan on uh, you know, hopefully releasing in Vermont, but as, as, uh, you know, as an industry as a whole, there's a lot of great innovation going on. You know, the farm bill really opened up the path to these minor cannabinoids and, and uh. really looking at different minor cannabinoids and, and, um, you know, how they, um, you know, uh, how they re interact and react within our bodies and the pharmacology of those cannabinoids. Um, you know, how, how does one access these minor cannabinoids in bulk? There's a lot of great, you know, bioenzymatic type, uh, strategies that are being implemented that that's really interesting um, and then more on the recreational you know adult use TSC side is you know how, how do we uh, interest of ours how, how do we you know use our technology to 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 mimic the profile of the plant in the oil form right and I don't know if, if you know the proper terminology is full spectrum or not but how do we take the best attributes of, of the flower and preserve those attributes in, the, in an oil form, right? Um, so we've been doing a lot of work, you know, around that. Oh, that's pretty interesting. The, uh, so we'll have to somehow get you onto the CBD Expo, get you onto a platform and, and uh, on a few panels and stuff and uh, be able to answer people's questions, which is pretty exciting to be focused on the science side. But uh, I, I don't know if we actually started it off with, uh, you know, coffee with cannabis. Coffee with cannabis. Or coffee with uh, with chemists, either way. But uh, appreciate your time and uh, spending time with me. And we'll uh, we'll catch you on the next next time around. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.